so much. My name is Richard Gage, AIA. I've been a practicing architect for 20 years, and I'm a member of the American Institute of Architects. I became interested in the World Trade Center high-rise collapses on 9-11 after hearing the startling conclusions of a reluctant 9-11 researcher, David Ray Griffin, on San Francisco Bay Area's KPFA radio, Guns and Butter, with Bonnie Faulkner in March of 2006. This has changed my life radically and launched my own personal and professional quest for 9-11 truth, inspiring me to found architects and engineers for 9-11 truth which now numbers hundreds of architects and engineers who are demanding a real investigation into the destruction of these buildings. Like many other architects, I've designed numerous fireproof steel frame buildings in my career, including these three and ten million dollar gymnasiums and the day-to-day -day construction administration services for this hundred twenty million dollar high school in San Ramon, California. I'd like to start by thanking each and every one of you for being willing to consider the very difficult subject of the destruction of the World Trade Center and its staggering loss of life on 9-11. Just as architecture and engineering projects are sometimes joyful, sometimes quite difficult, this particular project has proven to be extremely difficult. Not difficult in terms of reaching conclusions, but difficult in terms of the implications of those conclusions and finding people who are open-minded enough to be willing to hear the facts about these building collapses. Check out every fact that we point out because it's extremely important that we know the whole truth about this event. After all, it served as the pretext for the invasion of two countries in which already over a million people have perished. Also, as the pretext for the loss of many of our own cherished liberties here at home, in the United States through recent legislation such as the Patriot Act, the Military Commissions Act, and the forthcoming Senate Bill 1959, the Violent Radicalization and Homegrown Terrorism Act, in which many of us can be named a terrorist and have no right to an attorney or trial by jury. Another 9-11 could happen again if we don't dedicate ourselves to finding out exactly what happened and why, and to bringing those actually responsible to justice. We must peer into the painful part of our recent history and to re-examine the relatively new physical evidence from 9-11 which we have not seen in the mainstream media and to find out why, for instance, a 2006 poll by the New York Times and CBS reveals that 28 percent of Americans believe that the Bush administration is lying and not just about Iraq but about the events of 9-11 and Time magazine reporting that 36 percent of Americans consider it likely or somewhat likely that government officials either allowed the attacks to be carried out or carried them out themselves of even greater concern another poll that year by Scripps Howard Ohio University which found that a shocking 16% of Americans believe that the World Trade Center Twin Towers were brought down by explosives. NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, claims they found no evidence for explosive demolition at the Twin Towers. Later, they admit that they never looked for it. How can you find what you are not looking for? Well, architects, engineers, scientists, and many others looked for it, and it was not hard to find. We've been speaking about it for two years now in over three dozen cities, in a dozen states, and in Canada. We're proud to be a part of the international 9-11 truth movement, which is growing by millions every year. We now have hundreds of architects and engineers for 9-11 truth demanding a real investigation. This is our website. You can find on the right side the bullet points of information that we're going to be going through today. It's ae911truth.org. On the left side, you'll see the PowerPoint. You can step through it at your own pace because you may not have time to follow and read all the text and absorb the information that we're rapidly going to be going through. You can also watch the DVD on the left side, and you can purchase the DVD, of course, online. You can sign the petition after you find yourself convinced the ever-growing number of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth are not conspiracy theorists. 
We're building in technical professionals and looking at the science-based forensic evidence in the destruction of these high-rises on 9-11. First, let the technical truths emerge. Then, if necessary, cope with the inevitable conspiracy and other questions. Tonight, we're presenting to you the technical truths, the evidence found for the explosive demolition of all three World Trade Center high-rise collapses on 9-11, the iconic Twin Towers and the mysterious Building 7. 9-11, just the utterance of it brings us right back to the terror-filled morning. We were subjected to these shocking attacks, killing thousands of Americans, destroying cultural icons. The six years has given us time to step back and examine these events more objectively, to step back from the shock-induced trance, really, to evaluate the relatively new evidence that's only come out in the last couple of years, and to re-examine these three high-rise collapses more objectively. Let's begin with an overview of the events of that morning in order to start us off on the same page, looking at the jets and the impacts and how this myth developed. On September 11th, we learned that four passenger planes were hijacked and taken radically off course. Within an hour, two of the planes had flown into the enormous steel towers of the World Trade Center, creating fires and eventually toppling them. Dazed by the news, the American public soon believed the fires in the towers had burned so hot they caused the steel frames of the buildings to give way. A myth developed, fed by official sources through the media to a bewildered audience. Elements of the myth. The impact of the airplanes, gallons of burning jet fuel, steel melting, the buildings failing and suddenly imploding. In a mere 10 seconds, 110 stories hurtled earthward, pulverizing into dust. Right from the start, on the street itself, the official story was born. Come out of nowhere and just Scream right into the side of the Twin Tower, exploding through the other side. And then I witnessed both towers collapse, one first and then the second, mostly due to structural failure because the fire was just too intense. The myth bled into the FEMA report and was echoed by the experts. It was the combination of the impact load doing great damage to the building, followed by the fire that caused collapse. Well, let's take a look at that. What we do is we apply the scientific method, which many of us learned in seventh and eighth grade. It's the best way yet discovered for winnowing truth from lies and delusion. The simple version looks something like this. We formulate a question. How did the Twin Towers collapse? We perform research. We make observations. We construct a hypothesis. We have an idea how it collapsed. It collapsed by fire. It collapsed by explosive controlled demolition. We make some predictions, and we test those predictions and those assumptions with experiments, objective, verifiable, repeatable experiments. We analyze the results, and we draw conclusions. Now, if those conclusions are found to be corroborated by the evidence, we report it in an open, transparent manner, where our experiments and our findings can be repeated. If, the, if it is not found to be corroborated, we think and try again and construct a new hypothesis with new observations, new research. Buildings are destroyed by a number of different forces, each of which have very different and identifiable characteristics. For instance, fires affect buildings quite differently than controlled demolitions. Fires, by their nature, tend to creep from place to place. As they run out of fuel, moving to fresh new fuel sources, leaving the burned out area to cool. So when collapses do occur, and by the way, you'll note that they've never occurred in over a hundred examples of very hot, very large, and very long-lasting fires.
buildings tend to fall over. They, they fall asymmetrically. They're burned out on one side organically, if you will. It's a natural process. They don't fall straight down through the path of greatest resistance. Let's listen to Jonathan Barnett from FEMA talk about what fires are expected to do in steel buildings. The way in which steel-framed buildings behave in fires depends on their construction. In this test, done by British Steel in 1995, a large amount of typical office furniture was burned to see what would happen to the heavy steel beams that supported the ceiling. When steel is bare, when it heats up, uh, it uh, gets weaker. It's not that it melts in a fire. In fact, uh, the fires, normal fires, are not hot enough to melt steel. Even if you were, for example, to uh, use an unusual uh, fuel like um, kerosene, you cannot achieve temperatures hot enough to melt steel. But what happens is it starts to lose its strength. And as it loses its strength, uh, it starts to sag. It, it becomes uh, softer and sags and can no longer support the load. This was the largest test of its kind ever conducted. It showed how unprotected steel can be distorted even by a normal office fire. But as is typical in steel buildings, the structural beams only slowly and progressively warped and sagged. There was no chance of a sudden collapse. In over 20 years, um, I have not seen, until recently, a protected steel structure that has collapsed in a fire. So what was the cause of the devastating, explosive failure that happened to the World Trade Center? These particular buildings collapsed. They follow the path of least resistance, or they fell over. You can see that the building structure holds the building together in some recognizable form. The structural elements have not been dismembered from each other, and their concrete is not pulverized to dust. They follow the path of least resistance, which is generally over. These buildings exploded. Witnesses hear sounds of explosions. They see flashes of light. There's thick, billowing, and enormous pyroclastic clouds of pulverized concrete. The expansion of the gases very quickly produces this cauliflower-like formation that we see in the smoke. This is a controlled demolition. Let's focus on this type of destruction first. We have hundreds of examples from all across the country from which to make our comparison because it's the most commonly used method to demolish high-rises. This is what a high-rise looks like when it's being demolished with explosives. Controlled demolitions can be engineered in many different ways. Normally, the purpose of a controlled demolition is to remove a structure while avoiding damage to adjacent structures and to do so economically. Typically, a tall building like this is demolished by placing thousands of cutter charges throughout the columns and beams in the building and then detonating them in a very precise order, starting with the interior structures and then progressing outward, synchronistically timed floor by floor. Destroying the interior columns allows the unsupported weight to pull the exterior inward. Destroying the building from the ground up allows the weight of the building to be harnessed to do much of the destruction. So the result is an implosion, producing a vertical, symmetrical collapse at freefall speed into a consolidated rubble pile that's broken up and ready for loading and shipment. Now this is a feat that only a handful of companies in the United States can accomplish. Let's take a look at some of the key characteristics of controlled demolition. First, we have a sudden onset of destruction at the base of the structure. We have straight down symmetrical collapse into its own footprint. Because demolition waves remove the column support, resulting in a free fall speed, virtually, through the path of what was the greatest resistance, thousands of tons of structural steel. We have a total dismemberment of the steel structure, so it's loaded and ready for shipment. We have minimal damage to adjacent structures, sounds and flashes of explosions heard and seen by witnesses, enormous clouds of pulverized concrete, squibs sometimes, explosive 
charges that go off at the wrong times. Chemical evidence of cutter charges. These are all fairly typical and they go to show us direct evidence of explosive destruction. Now the interesting thing is that not one of these typical characteristics of controlled demolition can be explained or accounted for by fire, let alone all ten of them. Typically we'll have government documentation, expert corroboration, foreknowledge, and video documentation, all of which supports the hypothesis of controlled demolition, providing proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Let's take a look at World Trade Center 7 now. It was 47 stories tall, what would have been the tallest building in 33 of our states, half the height of the Twin Towers, dwarfed only by its proximity to what was, for a couple of years, the tallest buildings in the world. It was not hit by an airplane. It was the third World Trade Center high-rise to collapse on 9-11 at about 5.20 in the afternoon. World Trade Center 7 was hit by debris from the North Tower. You can see it being pelted here. And it sustained about eight fires, according to NIST, on various floors. This is the World Trade Center 7, 47 stories high. Don't be confused by the shadow from this building. Here we have the 12th and 13th floor fires and the 7th floor fire on the north side of the building, the opposite side of the building that was being pelted by the North Tower. Curiously enough, the Securities and Exchange Commission was operating out of this floor, which lost thousands of files related to hundreds of cases it was actively pursuing against Wall Street companies like Enron and WorldCom. So we are looking for an investigation that goes well beyond the uh, buildings, of course. Now let's take a look at the evidence of World Trade Center 7 and see how it stacks up against the typical features of a controlled demolition, starting with, is there a sudden onset of destruction? Let's listen to this emergency word. We were watching the building actually because it was on fire, the, uh, the bottom floors of the, the building were on fire and uh, you know we heard this, this sound that sounded like a clap of thunder, turned around, we were shocked to see that the building was uh, uh, well, it looked like there was um, a shock wave uh, ripping through the building and the windows all uh, busted out and, you know, it was, it was horrifying. And then, uh, you know, about a second later, the bottom floor caves out and uh, the building followed after that and um, we saw the building crash down all the way to the ground. A sound of a clap of thunder, a shock wave ripping through the building and windows busting out and then the building coming down. Do we have a straight down symmetrical collapse into the building's footprint? Let's listen to Dan Rather narrate this collapse for us as we take our first look at the collapse of Building 7. And what you're seeing are high shots. Now, here we're going to show you a videotape of the collapse itself. Describe that. Now we go to videotape the collapse of this building. It's amazing. A amazing, incredible, pick your word. For the third time today, it's reminiscent of those pictures we've all seen too much on television before when a building was deliberately destroyed, destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down. What, Dan? Deliberately destroyed by well-placed dynamite to knock it down? Dan never repeated these words after this first day. In fact, we didn't see this building coming down after 9-11. Let's take a look and this side-by-side -side comparison with a known controlled demolition on the right. Did the building fall into its own footprint? Pretty much so, a little bit of overlapping into the street. Do we have demolition waves? And how do these remove the column support? Well, here's a floor plan of building seven. Now to bring a building smoothly, symmetrically into its own footprint without falling over, what we have to do is remove the core columns because what we want to do is bring the outside of the building in on itself. Now this involves a high degree of precision that fire is not capable of being an organic process. We're told by NIST that there is virtually no 
influence in the collapse from the debris from the North Tower or the damage caused by it or from the diesel that may have been spilling out of the diesel line. Why? Well, the East Penthouse is the first part of the building to collapse a few seconds before the global collapse. NIST is now targeting column number 79. That is where they say the collapse initiated. Do we have a free fall speed of collapse through the path of greatest resistance? Let's listen to David Chandler. We can measure the acceleration of Building 7 by video analysis. I used a magnifying glass to place markers at the corner of the building on each frame. From this, the software constructs a data table and various graphs. The slope of the velocity graph gives the acceleration. Note that global collapse starts suddenly, and for the next 2.5 seconds, the building accelerates at the rate of 9.88 meters per second squared. The acceleration of gravity in New York City is 9.802 meters per second squared. The difference is not significant. In other words, the rate of collapse of World Trade Center Building 7 over the first 2.5 seconds is literally indistinguishable from free fall in a vacuum. What are we talking about? You can see second by second the building gaining downward momentum. You can plot the drop distance on a graph of time and it fits the free fall curve almost perfectly. What does this mean? That the columns had to have been removed and removed virtually simultaneously on each floor, synchronistically timed, so the building had no resistance virtually on the way down. Do we have a total dismemberment of the steel structure? We had a 47-story skyscraper compressed to four stories. How does this happen? This building had some moment-resisting frames on several floors. That's where the, the beams are welded very rigidly to the columns. Do we have sounds of explosions, though? Here's Craig Bartmer from the New York Police Department. The whole time you hear him, thum, 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 so... I, <laughs> I think I know an explosion when I hear it. <laughs> I was real close to Building 7 when it fell down, but that didn't sound like just a building falling down to me while I was running away from it. Um, there's a lot of eyewitness testimony down there hearing explosions. I didn't see any reason for that building to fall down the way it did, and a lot of guys should be saying the same thing. How about Kevin McPadden? He came back over with his hand over the radio and it sounded like a countdown. And at the last few seconds, he took his hand off and you heard three, two, one. And he was just saying, just run for your life, just run for your life. And then it was like another two, three seconds, you heard explosions, like ba boom. It's like a distinct sound. It's not like when in compression, like boom, 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 like floors that were dropping and collapsing. This was a boom, and like you felt a rumble in the ground, like almost like you wanted to grab onto something. That, to me, I knew that was an explosion. There was no doubt in my mind. Do we have enormous clouds of pyroclastic smoke from the pulverized concrete? Watch the concrete entrained in the air racing down every street in each direction at 35 miles an hour. This incredible volume of pyroclastic dust enfolding itself. It takes incredible quantities of heat to create this kind of action. A lot more heat than the eight various fires that were on these floors. Do we have pools of molten iron? Let's start with the South Tower now. This section applies to the World Trade Center Twin Towers and Building 7. We're told by NIST that this substance must be melted aluminum from the airplane. But melted aluminum looks like melted aluminum. <laughs> it's silvery. It doesn't uh, glow in daylight conditions. As of 21 days after the attack, the fires were still burning and molten steel was still running, says. World Trade Center structural engineer Leslie Robertson to a conference of structural engineers on October 5th, 2001, one month after 9-11.
Debris past the columns was red hot, molten, running. Fires burned, molten metal flowed in the pile of ruins, still settling beneath my feet. Well, what do the first responders and the demolition contractors say about molten metal? Saw pools of literally molten steel. Molten metal beams had just been totally melted. It was dripping from the molten steel. Steel flowed in molten streams. They're finding molten steel, seeing the molten steel, uncovering red-hot metal beams. Molten metal, red-hot, weeks after the event. Molten steel at the heart of the tower's remains. Molten steel beams, streams of molten metal that leaked from the hot cores and flowed down the broken walls. Molten metal dripping from a beam. The end of the beam would be dripping with molten steel. And this structural engineer, Abu Hazan Astani from Berkeley, cites and documents, I saw melting of girders in the World Trade Center. Still so hot that molten metal dripped down the side of the wall from Building 6. A fire truck 10 feet below the ground that was still burning two weeks after the tower collapsed. It's metal so hot that it looked like a vat of molten steel. Pieces of steel, still cherry red. One of the more unusual artifacts to emerge from the rubble is this rock-like object that has come to be known as the meteorite. It's this fused element of, of steel, mo molten steel and concrete and all of these things all fused by the heat. And architects, engineers, people who work with steel, welders have just never seen the level of destruction and the level of deformation of this material in our lives. These cooled meteorites are not aluminum because aluminum doesn't rust. So it's not a melted airplane. Mark Loiseau, the president of Controlled Demolition Incorporated, told the American Free Press that in the basements of the World Trade Center, where 47 central support columns connected to the bedrock, hot spots of literally molten steel were discovered more than a month after September 11th. These incredibly hot areas were found at the bottoms of the elevator shafts, down seven basement levels. The molten steel was found three, four, and five weeks later when the rubble was being removed. He said that molten steel was also found at World Trade Center 7. The highest temperature was in the east corner of the South Tower, where a temperature of 1,377 degrees Fahrenheit was recorded. The molten steel in the basement was more than double that temperature. What are we talking about here? Here is Building 7 at A and B, and here is the North Tower and the South Tower. These hot spots are 1,340 to 1,370 degrees. These are the temperatures of the hottest office fires. There was no fire on the surface of ground zero after the collapses. What are we measuring here? We're measuring the molten metal that was seen by these first responders four, five, six stories down below in the basements that was surely at least twice or three times these temperatures. What's the problem with that? Office fires, Eager says 1,200 degrees. Uh, NIST claims 1,800 degrees, for which we have no evidence for office fires of that temperature in the Trade Center towers. Structural steel doesn't even begin to melt until 2,700 or so degrees. We're missing 1,000 to 2,000 degrees of temperature, heat energy required to produce this stuff. Where is it coming from? We'll be taking a look at a possible suspect, thermite, which reaches temperatures of 4,500 degrees. Molten metal flowing off the substance held in the jaws of this backhoe. Let's listen to John Gross, lead engineer of NIST, tell us about the molten metal from his perspective. I'm curious about uh, the uh, pool of molten steel that was found in the bottom of the, of the tower. Um, I, I am too. And <laughs> Please tell me about it. Have you, have you seen it? Well, I, not personally, but eyewitnesses there found huge poles of molten steel beneath the towers. And uh, scientists, some scientists don't think that the uh, collapse of the building could have melt, melted all that steel. And uh, Professor, physics professor, analyzed some of the steel, and uh, Stephen Jones, and he found evidence of, uh, of thermate residue, mm -hmm. which would explain how the buildings collapsed by means of pre-planted explosives. So, have you analyzed 
the, uh, the steel for uh, any of those residues? Um, first of all, let's go back to your basic uh, premise that there was uh, a pool of molten, molten steel. Um, I know of absolutely nobody, and no eyewitness who has said so, nobody who's produced it. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel, yeah, molten down. steel running down the channel rails. Like you're in a foundry. Mm -hmm. Lava. Like, like lava, lava from a volcano. No eyewitness who said so. There actually melted beams where it was molten steel that was being dug out. No eyewitness who said so. Underground, it was still so hot that molten metal dripped on the sides of a wall. No eyewitness who said so. And the cleanup was very difficult in the beginning. Steel was coming out red in certain areas from the first couple of weeks. No eyewitness who said so. As of 21 days after the attack, the fires were still burning and molten steel was still running, says. World Trade Center structural engineer Leslie Robertson. No eyewitness who said so. Saw pools of literally molten steel. No eyewitness who said so. And this structural engineer documents I saw melting of girders in the World Trade Center. Nobody who's produced it. Nobody who's produced it. This fused element of, of steel, mo molten steel. I know of absolutely nobody, no eyewitness who said so, nobody who's produced it. What is the problem here? Somebody's lying. I'm going to leave it up to you to make your own conclusions. The last fire was not even extinguished for three months after 9-11. Tom Manley says you couldn't even begin to imagine how much water was pumped in there. It was like you were creating a giant lake. Well, thermite contains its own source of oxygen. It burns just as well under water. How about chemical evidence, though? Where, where, what's... What produced all this molten metal? And what is thermite anyway? Thermite, an incendiary used by the military. Thermite is a compound of iron oxide and aluminum, which when ignited, sustains an extreme heat reaction, creating molten iron. In just two seconds, thermite can reach temperatures over 4,500 degrees Fahrenheit, quite enough to liquefy steel. We know that open-air fires cannot burn hot enough to melt steel, but metal had melted at the base of the towers. Appendix C of the FEMA report describes sulfur residues on the World Trade Center steel. The New York Times called this the deepest mystery of all. Sulfur slightly lowers the melting point of iron, and iron oxide and iron sulfide had formed on the surface of the structural steel. Sulfur used with thermite is called thermate, producing even faster results. An FPA 921 is the guide for fire and explosion investigations. Was it used? They say unusual residues could arise from thermite, magnesium, or other pyrotechnic materials. In a crime scene, which this was an example of, did NIST use the guide? No. They acknowledged they didn't even look for such evidence. But others did. Dr. Stephen Jones performed chemical analysis on the previously molten metal. He does some background research, again part of the scientific method. Thermite would create a characteristic burn pattern with a white ash, a white-yellow hot liquid metal, an intense white reaction zone seen. It would also leave behind chemical evidence. Common elements such as iron, aluminum, copper, calcium, silicon. Unusual elements such as fluorine and manganese left behind also in their residue. These elements here. He sent a sample from this 40 pound chunk of previously molten metal from one of those meteorites he finds that it's predominantly iron, so we can rule out aluminum from the jet plane. It has small amounts of aluminum, sulfur, and potassium, and manganese and fluorine in abundance. Manganese is from the potassium permanganate, commonly used as an oxidizer in thermite. Fluorine is also used in sol gel type thermite charges. So these appear to be the thermite fingerprint. Let's take a look at what else Dr. Jones found in the slag from the end of this memorial at Clarkston University. He performs his x-ray fluorescence 
on this small piece of slag and finds once again iron, sulfur, potassium, manganese, calcium. Gel explosives are a super thermite, tiny aluminum particles in iron oxide in this sol gel. They can be cast into shape. They're like a clay. Lawrence Livermore Lab did research on this, and this invention offers a thermite-based apparatus for cutting target materials. You pack the thermite in here, and you ignite it, and it comes out and is forced through melting the structural steel element in fractions of a second, uh, almost as effective as uh, high-energy explosives, RDX and C4, which are more common in classic controlled demolitions. If sol gels were used, they would leave behind a very unique signature, 1,3-diphenylpropane. Uh, and in fact, EPA finds one molecule in their toxicological studies at levels that dwarfed all others, 1,3-diphenylpropane. Eric Schwartz says we've never observed it in any other sampling we've ever done. But is there evidence of thermite in the World Trade Center dust? Dr. Jones received no less than four separate samples of World Trade Center dust, some of it from Jeanette McKinley's apartment across the street, where the windows blew in and filled her apartment with dust. Another sample was found uh, like 10 minutes later on the Brooklyn Bridge. Well, he takes this and he puts a magnet over it, and he finds that there are small particles that come up to the magnet. Some of them are angular, some of them are round. They look like this. In fact, he calculates by the weight of the amount of these spheres that he finds in the dust that there must have been about 10 tons for, the whole, for all of the dust that was available. They're about a sixteenth of an inch in diameter, the largest ones, and most of them, though, are smaller than a human hair. What could produce such an incredible array of microspheres? Well, if you had thousands of cutter charges going off in the columns and beams throughout the building, and they were, they were under this incredible pressure, what you'd see is something like this. Tens of thousands or millions of tiny droplets. What's the shape of those droplets? When a liquid is dispersed like this, its surface tension forms itself into almost a perfect sphere. In the case of molten iron, that those droplets cool and they fall along with the dust everywhere. He compares the spheres to a known thermite experiment performed by John Perulis in Nevada, uh, which find, finds the same spheres. In fact, we do another XEDS, and we find in the microspheres uh, the same kinds of evidence. We have iron, manganese, and in, in the case of uh, this known thermite signature, it, it matches basically. In other words, we have a controlled experiment to compare the results against. And for those who know how to read these graphs, uh, such as Dr. Jones and, and others, this is a pretty much of a direct match indicating that this is the signature of thermite. Dr. Jones is not the only one who finds these iron-rich microspheres. The EPA finds them in all the dust and the toxicological studies they're doing. They have no idea where they came from. They sweep it under the rug. It has only one possible formation, and that is from liquid molten iron under extreme pressure. R.J. Lee finds the iron-rich microspheres on top of the Deutsche Bank building in their toxicological studies. Is this what corroded the tops of these cars, this atomized thermite uh, cooling? Manganese was also found in large proportions, very toxic stuff from the city's chief medical examiner. Very, very concerned about it. Well, Dr. Jones concludes that given the mix of trace metals present in these high concentrations uh, in the dust, such as zinc, copper, manganese, and the formation of iron-rich aluminum spheres, it's clear that significant aluminothermic reactions occur, and he can reverse engineer this and suggest to us that there must have been in the thermite mix powders of aluminum, iron oxide, copper oxide, zinc nitrate, and potassium permanganate. Well, would there possibly be any unignited thermite pieces in the World Trade Center dust? Indeed, he finds it. It also comes up to the magnet from his dust samples many chips 
This one, a sixteenth of an inch long, red on one side, gray on the other. The red side is composed of tiny iron oxide particles and, and aluminum. In fact, he does an XEDS on this stuff too. And he finds a little bit of sulfur, more aluminum, lots of iron, and manganese. And compare that to the traditional thermite. It's also a match for unignited thermite. This stuff is not made in a cave in Afghanistan. The Lawrence Livermore lab came out with papers about this stuff. The particles being so small allow for almost instantaneous ignition between the two chemicals, the aluminum and the iron oxide, producing very explosive results. Los Alamos lab and Lawrence Livermore lab have produced these results. Then he continues his study and finds additional chips that are partially ignited with spheres embedded in them, indicating that the source of the spheres is, for all intents and purposes, identified very clearly. With Dr. Jones and his small team of scientists, through EDS, XRF, and WDS, identifies the components of these spheres and chips, predominantly iron, along with aluminum, oxygen, silicon, 1,3-diphenylpropane. The results coupled with the visual evidence, he says, at the scene, such as the flowing hot liquid metal, providing compelling evidence that thermite reaction compounds were deliberately placed in both World Trade Center towers and Building 7. These results are documented in a peer-reviewed journal. Verify the results, please. This must be repeatable. There's lots of dust out there. We encourage everyone who has any samples of this dust to email us at ae911truth.org so that we can get repeatable samplings done. We need a lot of this. Now, all of this is direct evidence of explosive destruction in Building 7. We'll come jump back to only Building 7 now. Now, none of these characteristics can be explained by fire, let alone all of them. Why? Well, buildings are protected from fire. High-rise steel frame buildings in particular have two- and three-hour fire protection designed to allow the occupants to escape a fire. But even after, in fires that are much longer than two hours, larger, these buildings have not collapsed. Why? Let's take a look. Here's New York. 1970, burned six hours over five floors. Los Angeles, three and a half hours over five floors. Philadelphia, 18 hours over eight floors. Caracas, Venezuela, burned 17 hours over 26 floors. Not one of these fi fires brought these high-rises down. In fact, no steel frame high-rise building has ever been brought down by any fire. Yet relatively small and randomly placed fires and a whole lot of smoke is to have brought this skyscraper, Building 7, down in six and a half seconds after burning in just that afternoon. How about that FEMA report and these investigations? Well, we had four investigations, starting in 2001 with the ASCE, American Society of Civil Engineers. We're told these are volunteers, but these are not your average PTA volunteers. These guys are in $10 million annually average between them, uh, working for the Defense Department in their with their expertise mainly on blast resistance of buildings. Then we have the FEMA report in 2002, which finally got some funding, $600,000. This is easily the third worst structural failure in modern history. It deserves a far greater response and resources. In 2002, we had the Silverstein Weidlinger report responsible for reversing the theory of FEMA, which came up basically with the pancake theory, or the zipper theory, where one truss pulled away from the columns and then caused the others to pull away, and that chain reaction went around, and then the, pan the, the floors pancaked all the way down. We'll talk about that. Silverstein Weidlinger report was responsible for changing that theory, because if that were true, it would have been the bolts that broke and Therefore, Larry Silverstein, the overall owner of this complex, would not have been paid 
his $5.6 billion that he's been paid on the insurance settlement. Why? Because that would have been the building's fault instead of the terrorist's fault. So we had to have another theory. And the new theory states that the trusses sagged, pulled in the columns, they blamed the persistence of that connection, and then the columns buckled, and then the whole thing came down. Either way, it's something that we're going to be looking at very, very critically here in a moment. Then we have the NIST investigation, which took over uh, all of these investigations in 2005 and came up with a three-year, $20 million effort. We'll take a close look at NIST's work. These experts who worked on these buildings all worked from the FEMA report, or most of them, into the Weidlinger report and into the NIST report. These are not independent investigation by any means whatsoever. Let's listen to what FEMA did conclude, because it is interesting. Evidence of a severe high temperature corrosion attack on the steel, including rapid oxidation, sulfidation, and subsequent intergranular melting. Very interesting. Remember, office fires don't melt steel. What melted this steel? Sulfur formed during this hot corrosion attack on the steel. Here is the intergranular melting documented for all of us. Thank you capable of turning a solid steel girder into Swiss cheese, like this former wide flange column from the structural steel in Building 7. Now they document this very carefully in their Appendix C. Listen to this. Gaping holes, some larger than a silver dollar, let light shine through. A one-inch column being reduced to half-inch thickness, its edges curled like a paper scroll having been thinned to almost razor sharpness. This was the flange curled up on itself. This is the web of that wide flange column. NIST swept this entire Appendix C under the rug, and we do not have it in the official report today. Listen to this, though. The collapse of World Trade Center 7 had a small debris field as the facade was pulled downward, suggesting internal failure and implosion. The specifics of the fires in World Trade Center 7 and how they caused the building to collapse remain unknown at this time. What? Unknown? The best hypothesis, fire plus random damage, and then complete collapse, has only a low probability of occurrence. Wait a minute. You spent $600,000 of our taxpayer money and, and over a year investigating this and it has a your best hypothesis isn't even right. What do you do when your hypothesis is not corroborated by the facts? You go back and you construct a new hypothesis. In FEMA's case, punt. And that's what they did. They say further research, investigation, and analysis are, are needed to resolve this issue. But unfortunately, for those hoping to resolve the issue, much of that evidence had already been destroyed, about 99% of it, in fact, by FEMA before the report came out in May of 2002. Let's listen to what real investigation should have been performed. Normally, uh, when you have a structural failure, uh, you carefully go through the debris field, uh, looking at each item, photographing every beam as it collapsed and every uh, column where it is in the ground, and you pick them up very carefully and you uh, look at each element. We were unable to do that in the case of Tower 7. Why? Because all the steel was removed before the report came out. In fact, 800 truckloads a day. Easily the, third, the three worst structural failures in modern history. 250 pieces were saved. Crucial evidence that could answer the questions is on the slow boat to China, exclaims Bill Manning, editor-in-chief of the 125-year-old fire engineering magazine that brings together fire protection engineers to communicate with each other, showing an astounding ignorance of the government officials to the value of a thorough scientific investigation. The destruction and removal of evidence must stop immediately. Commission a fully resourced blue ribbon panel to conduct a clean and thorough investigation is what they were calling for. If the evidence contradicts your fire hypothesis, destroy it. That's where our tax dollars are going. How about the 9-11 Commission, which was tasked with giving us the fullest explanation? No. 
Not one sentence in the 571 pages of the 9-11 Commission report even mentions the destruction of World Trade Center 7. Is this one of the reasons, perhaps, that Senator Max Cleland resigns from the Commission, citing it's a national scandal, the investigation is compromised? How about expert corroboration? How about Danny Jewenko, 27-year controlled demolitions expert? It starts from below. They've simply blown away the columns. It's controlled demolition. A team of experts did this. It's professional work, without a doubt. How about Hugo Bachman, Professor Emeritus, Chairman, Department of Structural Dynamic at Earthquake Engineering, Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. In my opinion, the building, World Trade Center 7, was with great probability professionally demolished. How about Kamal Obeid with Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, a structural engineer. A localized failure in a steel frame building like World Trade Center 7 cannot cause a catastrophic collapse like a house of cards without a simultaneous and patterned loss of several of its columns at key locations within the building. Does that sound like fire? <laughs> no. How about this forensic fire protection engineer, once again, Jonathan Barnett? We were surprised that Tower 7 collapsed, uh, we being the team that investigated what occurred on that day. Building 7, do we have any foreknowledge of its destruction? We're moving the command post over this way. That building's coming down, says Chief Nick Viscani. Well, there was some structural damage, as we've noted, and they were concerned about it. By noon or 1 o'clock, they told us we had to move from the triage site up to Pace University a little further away because Building 7 was going to come down or being brought down, says Indira Singh interviewed by Bonnie Faulkner on KPFA. Did they actually use the words brought down? Yeah, that's what they said. We're going to have to bring it down. This involves volition. Listen to these construction workers walking away from Building 7 and this police officer caught on CNN camera. Keep your eye on that building. It'll be coming down soon. We are walking back. There's a building about to blow up. Full flame. Debris coming down. Keep your eye on that building. It's about to come down. The building is about to blow up. Flame and debris coming down. How do they know? And how about Kevin McPadden? What did he say? At the last few seconds, he took his hand off, and you heard three, two, one. Countdown? Does that imply foreknowledge? Do fires bring buildings down to countdowns? <laughs> Unlikely. The collapsed happened. It's true. Jane Stanley is here announcing it. She says the 47-story Solomon Brothers building close to the World Trade Center has also collapsed. And there it is standing behind her. The BBC apologizes for this grievous error, citing the confusing events of the day. <laughs> but does that make them psychic? <laughs> Unlikely. I believe we've shown that Building 7 matches all of the features of controlled demolition in the classic sense. Is it likely that Al-Qaeda could have had access to this building, which had to have been one of the most secure outside the Pentagon? We have to ask ourselves that question a few times because if they didn't, then who did? This is as far as we go. You need to go farther, and there are resources at your disposal to do just that. I will point them out after we look at the World Trade Center Twin Towers because as clear as the evidence is for the destruction of Building 7 by explosives, the evidence is even more clear in the case of the Twin Towers. When you look at it with a new pair of glasses and looking at the forensic science-based evidence. Let's get introduced here. Some called it the crowning achievement of the international style, this pair of buildings. Others, heartless modernism. In fact, architect Robert Stern calls it gigantic dumbness. Right? It's two squares extruded just to the point where they become the highest buildings in the world. 
Well, either way, no matter how you feel about these buildings, they did have uh, innovative structural engineering led by John Skilling and his aide, Leslie Robertson, who helped Minoru Yamasaki preserve the simple sculptural purity of his forms. And you can compare this building to the elegant Art Deco of the Empire State Building and come to your own conclusions about design. Uh, but it did eclipse the, the highest building in the world in 1976, but just for a couple of years until the Sears Tower outgrew it. The structural engineering innovations were quite extraordinary, uh, lending the award, the engineering project that demonstrates the greatest engineering skills and represents the greatest contribution to engineering progress and mankind by the American Society of Civil Engineers. Let's take a look at what we achieved. We have 60-foot spans. We have a perimeter structure, which is like a tube structure, and this inner core. Let's take a look at it. Most high-rises up to this time were built on a dense grid of steel or concrete frames all the way throughout the building in a 20 or 30-foot grid. The twin towers were built as a tube structure with a very dense, strong mesh of steel surrounding the exterior and acting as a bearing wall which resists the lateral loads, earthquake, and in the case of this building, particularly wind. Hurricanes up to 140 miles an hour it was designed to resist. This, this perimeter structure was 14-inch uh, columns, 3 foot 9 inches on center. Inside was this core, a dense grid of 47 immense box columns, 4 inch thick at the base, 2 inch thick at mid-height. Prefabricated floor assemblies with 22 gauge steel decking, over which was poured reinforced concrete and held up by 29 inch deep open web steel trusses. Now these trusses were bolted to the perimeter columns and the core columns with these 5 8 inch bolts which we talked about the different theories about what happened to those bolts. Now this is a structure within a structure. This in dense core structure would have remained standing 1300 feet in the air if this surrounding less strong floor structure were to have collapsed around it. In fact, the perimeter structure probably would have been left standing for a while until it, its lack of support gave in. This is the core columns, 52 inches by 22 inches along the long edge, almost solid steel at the bottom, continuously welded from the bottom all the way to the top. Now, any 1800 degree fire would have been conducted throughout this 100,000 ton heat sink. That's the reason there's been no collapse of steel frame high rise fires because of the steel. Let's take a look at the structural imperative that was given to John Skilling. John Skilling and Les Robertson were the structural engineers who designed the streamlined steel frames of the Twin Towers in the 1960s. Because a wayward army bomber flew into the Empire State Building in 1945, the towers were built with skyscraper crashes in mind. We had designed the project for the impact of the our largest airplane of its time, the, the Boeing 707. That is to take this jet airplane, run it into the building, destroy a lot of structure, and still have it stand up. The building was designed to have a fully loaded 707 crash into it. That was the largest plane at the time. I believe that the building probably could sustain multiple impacts of jetliners because this structure is like the mosquito netting on your screen door. This intense grid and the jet plane is just a pencil puncturing that screen netting. It really does nothing to the screen netting. A very robust structure in fact the forces coming down routed themselves around. They arched around the opening created by the airplane. In fact, uh, Iger says uh, the towers withstood the initial impact of the aircraft. Uh, this ability to withstand the initial impact is hardly surprising given the robust nature. Now, we have the North Tower being hit at 8.46 in the morning. And about 102 minutes later, 
after fires traveled around the, the floors and up the floors in the case of the North Tower, the building did collapse. The South Tower was hit about 15 minutes later, and after only about 56 minutes, it collapses as the fires were in fact diminishing severely. Gilling noted that he designed the towers to take a hit from a Boeing 707 traveling 600 miles an hour. When he was asked if he considered plane crashes, he cites our analysis indicated the biggest problem would be the fact that all the fuel would dump into the building, but the building structure would still be there. This is FEMA's theory. We have the the sagging of the trusses and the pulling away from the column and then the subsequent pancaking down. Uh, again, the, the trusses one after the other, six foot eight inches, every truss disengaging from the perimeter wall. NIST turns it around and blames the persistence of these connections pulling in the columns, causing the columns to buckle. Now, it's generally more difficult for, for people to understand that the towers were a controlled demolition because it was so outside of our frame of reference. We'd never seen anything like this. So this combined with the shock uh, kept us from being objective. But if you were to plan a fire-induced collapse as a result of airplanes, you'd start the explosions at the point of jet plane impacts. So in World Trade Center 2 and 1, we have all of the key characteristic features of controlled demolitions, but with some of these key differences. We have a beginning of detonation at the point of jet plane impacts, not at the base of the building. In addition, we have not an implosion, but where everything is being exploded outside the footprint. We have squibs, or these explosions, that occur 20, 40, and even 60 stories down below. And as we already discussed the evidence for thermite uh, in the molten metal and in the dust in the iron-rich microspheres. So let's take a look starting with the sudden onset. And what is the evidence for this and how is it produced? Produced by the explosions. Now the city's fire commissioner Thomas von Essen requires all of his EMTs and firefighters to record their experiences, about uh, 500 of them, and in 12,000 pages uh, as it turns out, collected from 2001 to 2002, the New York State Court of Appeals overturns the city's request to hold on to this information against the lawsuit by the New York Times. They failed, and why was the city holding on to this information? Was it because 118 of these firefighters witnessed sounds and flashes of explosions? We felt the ground shake. You could see the tower sway, and then it just came down. All of a sudden, the ground just started shaking. It shook my bones. Shortly before the first tower came down, I remember feeling the ground shaking. Somewhere around the middle of the World Trade Center, there was this orange and red flash coming out. Initially, just one flash. Then it just kept popping all the way around the building. The building had started to explode. It's like on television, they blow up these buildings. It seemed like it was going all the way around, like a belt. All these explosions. Pop, pop, pop. That's when I heard the building coming down. Saw a brief number of light sources being emitted from inside the building between floors 10 and 15. I saw low-level flashes. We actually heard the pops. You know, you heard the pops of the building. It was blowing out on all four sides. With each popping sound, it was initially an orange, and then a red flash came out of the building. Then it would just go around the building on both sides. So I saw a flash, 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 and then it looked like the building come, came down. I thought the terrorists planted explosives somewhere in the building. That's how loud it was, a crackling explosive. Well, you can hear that explosive in this video. Yeah, here's one of the guys who can tell you I'm okay, all right? Here, hold on. You wanna, oh. call, your, you wanna call your mother or something? Oh, you right now. Gotta get back Does that sound like a fire or collapsing floors? None of these explosions are a part of the official story. Another loud boom at the upper floors, and then there was a series of smaller explosions which appeared to go completely around the building at the upper floors. Before it came down, I saw low-level flashes. Flash, 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 and then it looked like the building came down. Did you see any flashes? I said, yeah. I thought it was just me. He said, no, I saw them too. 
What did these guys experience? We started running. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if they had detonated. Yeah, you know, detonated. They were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. How about the news reporters? What do they say? They tend to tell the truth, as we pointed out earlier, on the first day. And then we don't hear that truth again. What happens to it? Anybody who's ever watched a building being demolished on purpose knows that if you're going to do this, you have to get at the, at the under infrastructure of a building and bring it down. The entire building has just collapsed as if a demolition team set off. When you see the old demolitions of these old buildings, it My pulled God. it down on itself and it is not there anymore. I heard a second explosion and another rumble. A huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way. And all of a sudden, it was this big explosion. There was another big, big explosion. An hour later than that, we had that big explosion from much, much lower. Do you, do you know if it was an explosion or if it was a building collapse? To me, it sounded like it, it, to me, it sounded like an explosion, but it was a huge explosion. Chief Albert Turry said that there was another explosion which took place, and then an hour after, there was another explosion in one of the towers here. So according to his theory, he thinks that there were actually devices that were planted in the building. It just went ba-boom, it was like a bomb went off, and another explosion came right from it, just everyone flying. Like, it sounded like gunfire, you know, bang, 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 and then, and then all of a sudden, three big explosions. I was about five blocks away when that, I heard uh, explosions, three thuds. There was a uh, heavy-duty explosion. Again, none of these explosions are a part of the official story. Now, compare these explosions uh, to a known explosion on the left here. Upward. Outward arching streamers, pyroclastic volumes of dust, symmetrical display like a mushroom. Does it look like a gravitational collapse to you? How could explosives be placed in the World Trade Center Twin Towers with 50,000 occupants not knowing about it? Well, this is the floor plan. Let's enlarge it and take a close look. We note that the core structure the columns of which are immediately adjacent to almost all of the elevators at the lower levels, certainly. If you had access to the elevator hoistway, you would have access to the core columns and beams, and no one would see you. How about an elevator modernization, which we know was going on the nine months prior to 9-11? Yes, Elevator World, March 2001, documents it. In fact, they were in the middle of this modernization. Ace Elevator had the contract. We're not conspiracy theorists, but it's pretty obvious that somebody needs to be asked some very key questions. There are people who noted that the elevators were locked in turn and that there were guards placed at these locked elevators during the modernization. Wireless detonation is common in the industry. You don't need miles of wire, and you can detonate them remotely with great flexibility, in fact. Well, but is there a precedent? This tells us that it couldn't have been a controlled demolition because it didn't start at the bottom, right? That's where most controlled demolitions start with buildings. Let's take a look and see if there's another way to do it. The words of a senior blaster. We blow the basement, all the columns in the basement. Then we crack it up at the top to get it started. We go every other floor all the way down. Every explosive has a timer on it. That's why it's controlled. When the columns go, each floor goes down and impacts the one below and keeps going. Mark Loiseau is president of a company called Controlled Demolition. You don't have to go to the top floor. You can go almost anywhere in the structure, and given the right circumstances, you can release all of that stored energy, converting it into what is called kinetic energy. That's energy in motion. And that's what brings the building down. Well, here's a three-story top-down controlled demolition. Let's count them. One, two, three. Now, these are high-energy explosives, C4 and RDX, very loud booms and very visible flashes. Perhaps the reason thermite was used uh, is because they don't have as loud of uh, these explosions like these high-energy explosives. Uh, and they don't have the flashes that these do either. Here's a 20-story top uh, middle-down controlled demolition. You can start demolitions from wherever you would like. 
Let's look at the North Tower now. What I want to point out to you is that you're going to see some explosions up at the top of the building, curiously enough. And what's going to happen is this entire section is going to telescope such that half of it, its upper half, is destroyed before there's any movement from the jet plane impacts down. Let's take a look. Here's the first evidence of explosion, and then over here, and then the collapsing. Of course, the violent clouds which are emerging even prior to the collapse. We're going to take a close-up look after this second look. Let's take a look now closer up. Right away, we're seeing clouds forming up here. Well, wait, the collapse is supposed to be just down here. But we have asymmetrical damage to this building, right? The plane went in one side. And yet, this complete symmetrical uh, collapse, we'll use in quotes from now on. And let's keep going. Unexpected. And There's one more time. In terms of how swiftly it Belts, just like the firemen saw, all happened. the way around the building. They came down. The antenna falls Many first before anything else happened. falls, indicating core column damage first. Now take a look at this from the same tower from the bottom, noting the violence underneath the mushroom cloud. The, the collapse is supposed to be occurring way up here, but down below, as you'll see in this second run, incredible quantities of, of squibs, explosions bursting out. And on the third time, I'd like to direct your attention to this racing series of explosions down to the right side in the corner of this building. About 40 stories below the collapsing building. It gets painfully obvious after a while, doesn't it? entire building has just collapsed as if a demolition team set off when you see the note these multiple nodes of these independent explosions it's a little different than the north tower but it's still incredibly it the same anymore. after a while after all of these uh, explosions developed do we have a straight down symmetrical progression of collapse outside the footprint we had a 207 foot wide building FEMA tells us, and you can see in this document, that we have a 1,200-foot debris field, equidistant around each tower. Asymmetrical damage, symmetrical distribution, all through the site, in fact, and beyond. Do we have squibs, or these mistimed explosions? Some believe that these might be appropriately timed explosions. Whatever. In all the videos of the collapses, explosions can be seen bursting from the building 20 to 30 stories below the demolition wave. Here. 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 And here. Now NIST tells us that these are puffs of air being produced by the collapsing building pushing air down the hoistway like a piston. It's got to come out somewhere, right? Well, first of all, these are not puffs of air. They're pulverized building materials. And they occur at 160 to 200 feet, some of them, per second. These velocities are propelled by explosives. 20, 40, and 60 stories below. How can the piston be producing all of that? And in, in fact, there, there are these focalized ejections that occur halfway between the corners of the building. Also, if, say this was the 
open office space, space right, 60 feet long. The elevator hoistways over here. The, the piston's going to shove the air into this room. It's going to fill an, the, the room fairly uniformly with air pressure before it breaks any windows, right? And then it might break several, but not these highly focalized, uh, pinpoint accurate, uh, geometrically precise, violent ejections. No, it's, it's extremely unlikely. But let's look at a couple of them here. As the south tower begins to explode, we track two squibs near the bottom of the frame. They shoot out quickly at first, then slow and merge in with the rest of the dust cloud. Using the first few data points, we see the first squib shoots out at 44.98 meters per second, or about 100 miles per hour. Doing the same for the second squib, we get a speed of 56.3 meters per second, which works out closer to 126 miles per hour. 126 miles per hour of, of almost instant uh, ejection velocity? Does fire create that? Do we have a near freefall pace through the path of greatest resistance? Let's take a look. Galileo's law of falling bodies calculates the time in which an object will travel a certain distance in complete freefall. Distance, d, equals 16.8 times time in seconds squared. The South Tower was 1,362 feet tall. 1362 equals 16.08 times 84.7, or 9.2 seconds. The Twin Towers came down in nearly free fall speed. What are we talking about here? Let's just try to put this in perspective with this story problem. We have a 15-story building which we hold with this crane over 95 stories of nothing but air. No resistance, right? Just air resistance. Next to it, another 15-story building held over a 95-story building with, say, 80,000 tons of structural steel in it. Now we're going to pull the lever on these cranes and drop them both at once. I brought a 95-story building with me today. And we're going to just test this theory of NIST's. I've got two 15-story buildings. We've got 80,000 tons of structural steel in this one right here. And we've got air resistance here. So let's try it, OK? We'll put them both up here. We'll even give a little bit of impact load, too, OK? Ready? Three, two, one. Oh my God, the one without any resistance under it hit the ground first at virtually free fall speed. This doesn't take much, does it? What happened over here? The, the building above was, it met resistance. Through the, process, the energy of deformation, it came to a halt. In fact, you'll find on our website, ae911truth.org, that Ken Cutler and Gordon Ross produce these papers, and they show and calculate that, in fact, the building's downward momentum would have been almost immediately arrested. Where is the 15-story building that was driving this building down to the ground at free fall speed? In the first two seconds, you saw it reduce half of its mass. It was blown outside. It couldn't have been used to influence the downward progression of the building. In the next two seconds, after four seconds totally, it's destroyed itself. There's nothing crushing the building. It's tearing itself apart at free fall speed. And it's dismembering the steel structure. In fact, the leading edge of these mushroom clouds are full of perimeter columns, aluminum cladding, and other steel. Let's take a look at the South Tower in terms of dismemberment. See what's going on here. South Tower's on your left. It was hit lower by the aircraft. And as you can see, its, it's rapid destruction starts there, and it begins to tilt to the left. And it disappears into this cloud. We would expect to see this building, which is already tilted at 22 degrees and continuing its angular momentum, off-center of the building below it. How can it crush it symmetrically at free-fall speed when it's already off-center? 
And we don't see it either mangled up in some heap at the bottom uh, down on the pavement. It's been completely dismembered. Let's take a look from below, though. We have asymmetrical damage, and yet there's this symmetrical destruction occurring underneath the cloud all the way around the building like the firemen saw, even though this top mass has already fallen over. Free fall speed. Doesn't make sense to me. Steel frame structure was completely dismembered. There are no large chunks of building, only those shards that we saw of the perimeter structure. Does it look like a gravitational collapse to you? Do we have a lateral ejection of structural steel? Let's take a look. Now let's look at the collapse of the Twin Towers. We are seeing explosions rather than implosions, a first in demolition history. A sequenced rumble becomes a roar as debris is thrown outward. The damage is not contained. Windows are blown from neighborhood buildings. What kind of energy enabled this? Would fire hurl metal and concrete sideways into the air? Here, a chunk of steel was flung 400 feet, wedging itself deep into Three World Financial Center on Vesey Street. A FEMA photographer taking pictures of Ground Zero wondered why so many steel beams were jutting from neighborhood buildings. What shot pieces of the towers all the way across the street? In fact, the portions of the tower that had the greatest structural members, the sky lobbies and the mechanical floors, had the perimeter units thrown farther than the perimeter wall units from the upper floors, which theoretically should have, because they're higher, they should have gone farther, right? No, these perimeter units landed on the winter garden 600 feet away. Let's take a look at the physics of this. Girders weighing several tons were found 600 feet from the base of the North Tower. How fast they were ejected depends on where they originated. If they came from high in the building, they were thrown outward at about 50 miles per hour. If they came from lower down, the speed had to be even greater. Gravity alone cannot account for such high lateral ejection speeds. In fact, let's take a look at a couple of these specific ejections. Using special software, we can analyze motion on video clips frame by frame. I have placed markers on each frame so we can track a particular projectile. From the markers, we can get a data table and plot various graphs. The data here shows that the object we are tracking was shot horizontally at over 70 miles per hour. The energy needed to hurl a four-ton girder at this speed is comparable to the energy needed to hurl a 200-pound cannonball three miles. What about those floors, those pancakes? We're, we're, this is a pancake collapse. We're looking for some pancakes down below. This is a seven-story lobby. There's about two or three stories of stuff in there. We'll take a look at that stuff, but what I'm looking for is 110 floors with this kind of metal decking underneath four and five inches thick of concrete. An acre in size, each of them. 110 acres of these. How many floors do we find down at the bottom? Not 50, not 10, not even one. We don't even find metal decking down there or concrete. There's hardly any macroscopic chunks of concrete. What happened to the metal decking? What happened to the concrete? Tom Patrizzo brought these floor decks out, 6,000 of them, he says. I couldn't believe it. Not one floor panel, he notes when he comes back to help the cleanup. Pancakes occur in pancake collapses. Enormous pyroclastic clouds of pulverized concrete? Well, where is all the concrete, in fact? Let's listen to Jeff King. One of the most significant things to, to my thinking uh, uh, that indicates that this could not have been the sort of collapse that we are told it was is the presence of the dust clouds. Uh, and as you've seen in the pictures, and I'm sure all of us have, have uh, 
seen probably more than we would like. Uh, there were very, very large clouds of very thick dust that enveloped the area that crossed the river that made it almost all the way to New Jersey from the pictures that I've seen. Uh, this type of flow is something that we are familiar with in physics. It occurs in only two situations that we know of naturally. Um, one is in volcanic eruptions where a large amount of material is suddenly exploded into the air and basically forms small particles. Thank you, Jeff. How about New York Governor Pataki? And you look, and you see, and there's no concrete. There's very little concrete. All you see is aluminum and steel. What happened to the concrete? The concrete was pulverized, and I was down here Tuesday, and it was like you were on a foreign planet. All of lower Manhattan, not just this site, from river to river, there was dust powder, two, three inches thick. The concrete was just uh, pulverized. And how about this firefighter? You have two 110-story office buildings. You don't find a desk. You don't find a chair. You don't find a telephone, a computer. The biggest piece of a telephone I found was half of the keypad, and it was about this big. The building collapsed to dust. And this dust made it almost across to New Jersey, across the river. Uh, thick, billowing, laying a carpet of four to six inches thick around lower Manhattan, uh, pulverized to uh, 100 micron to, to 10 mil particles, almost like talcum powder, some of it. It's uh, very, very fine. Where's the grinder that produced this? 90,000 tons of it. In these clouds that expanded 10 times the volume of the buildings themselves in just 30 seconds. Now, the available gravitational potential in the whole building is about 110,000 kilowatt hours. That's basically the weight of the building times its height above the ground, uh, evened out. But the expansion of these clouds has been calculated to require about 10 times that energy in heat, which produces that expansion. So uh, we have a problem here. In fact, the gravitational potential of the entire building needs to also produce four other heat sinks. But first, we have a 15-story building. This part of the gravitational potential alone, it co it's converted all of its gravitational potential into kinetic energy. It can't do any more work. In other words, it can't fall at free fall speed and then also crush 80,000 tons of structural steel. It can't fall at free fall speed and also grind up 90,000 tons of concrete. It can't fall at free fall speed and create by friction or anything else the several tons of molten metal seen by the first responders. The energy doesn't add up. We're talking ab uh, overall about 50 times the gravitational potential energy of the building to produce all of this phenomena. How about the victims? In April 2006, New Yorkers were distressed to learn that bone fragments, human remains from 9-11, had been found on the roof of the nearby Deutsche Bank building. And how in, in God's name did those fragments get there? And bone fragments less than a centimeter long. How could they be so small? 700 bone fragments, a half an inch long, found on top of the skyscraper across the street. Think about that one. There were 2,749 victims, but only 300 whole bodies were found. 20,000 pieces of bodies found. 6,000 small enough to fit into a test tube. 1,100 victims completely unaccounted for. In other words, no pieces large enough to gain any DNA from, vaporized. 200 pieces were matched to one single person. Can, fire, and a gravitational collapse account for this massive pulverization of people. We talked about the iron microspheres. We talked about the chemical evidence of thermite in them and in the slag and the ends of the beams. And we talked about evidence of thermite in and unexploded thermite in the dust itself. All of this is direct evidence of explosive destruction. And none of it can be accounted for by fire. Let's have Dr. David Ray Griffin sum this one up for us. These facts taken together render the likelihood of the official theory 
essentially zero. In fact, each of the ten phenomena, the likelihood of it occurring without explosives being used is by itself essentially zero. But let's be generous and suggest maybe there's a 1% chance that these things could occur. Virtual free fall speed, straight down, enormous amount of dust, 1% chance. But when you figure up the probabilities then, when you say how many, uh, that two of them would occur, three of them would occur, by the time you get up to 10 of them occurring without explosive, you're talking about the likelihood of one in a trillion. So, we can say that the official theory about the towers is disproved as thoroughly as any such theory could possibly be. Whereas all the evidence can be explained by the alternative theory according to which the towers were brought down by explosives. The official theory is therefore an outrageous theory, whereas the alternative theory is, from a scientific point of view, the only possible theory. Thank you. How about that FEMA report? What does Engineering Magazine say about it? FEMA investigation is a half-baked farce, Bill Manning says, that may already have been commandeered by political forces whose primary interest, to put it mildly, lie far afield of full disclosure. The structural damage from the planes and the explosive ignition of jet fuel in themselves were not enough to bring down the towers. How about that NIST report? We got $20 million in three years. What happened with our tax dollars? The de their task was to determine how and why World Trade Center 1 and 2 collapsed and how and why World Trade Center 7 collapsed. Let's look at their objective. The focus of the investigation was on the sequence of events from the instant of aircraft impact to the initiation of collapse for each tower. For brevity in this report, this sequence is referred to as the probable collapse sequence. It doesn't actually include the structural behavior of the tower after the conditions for collapse initiation were reached and collapse became, they say, inevitable. Wait a minute. You're going to spend three years and $20 million and you're going to model every turbine in the airplane and you're going to stop the entire investigation before the real action begins, right when the point where you're going to stop at, at the point where the, the truss was sagging and pulling in the first column and, and you're just going to stop your, your, your analysis. How many engineers did you have working on this? And what are you concluding? This is, they have 10,000 pages in this report. This is the half page that explains everything after that. No analysis. Let's see their conclusion. The structure below the level of collapse initiation offered minimal resistance to the falling building mass at and above the impact zone. Structural engineers do this every day. This is not rocket science. You have the known weight of this building mass. You have what are known columns below it in order to resist it. You let it go in your models and you calculate what the, re what the resistance is. Why didn't they do it? Could it be because they knew darn well that it would not have collapsed at all? Wait, what was the report title? Final report on the collapse of the World Trade Center Twin Towers. Probably should have called it final report on the initiation of collapse. They also cast doubt on their own theory. They say to us in a letter to our request for correction, which several of us applied for and have yet to see adequate results from, we are unable to provide a full explanation of the total collapse of the Twin Towers. Thank you. We think so too. Prompting Jim Hoffman to write, uh, Building a Better Mirage, NIST's three-year, $20 million cover-up of the crime of the century in which he documents numerous unfounded assumptions. He documents that it's a mountain of distraction. They'll never read all this stuff. It's a tin rat. 10,000 pages, 1,000 pages modeling the airplanes. And as I mentioned, only half a page on their core presumption. Classic progressive collapse. How can it be classic if it's never before happened in history? 
as if some initiating element in a steel frame building caused the rest of it to ever collapse. He documents the startling omissions and outrageous lies, which you'll have to go into yourself when you have a little more time, and the fudged computer simulations. They document these unrealistic scenarios, uh, C and D, and the realistic scenarios, A and B. A and B didn't make the building collapse, so they crank up the airplane speed. They reduce the strength of the structure. They increase the fuel. They do all of these adjustments until they get in the more unrealistic scenarios, which they're actually fairly open about, to get the, the computer model to collapse. Structural engineers rail against NIST because they refuse to show the visualization. It's a black box. You cannot download any of this data. This was a public building, or at least before three months prior to 9-11, it was a public building, and it should be a public investigation. Clearly, it was a public event, prompting their former chief of their fire science division, Dr. Quintier, to call for an independent review. Let's look at real alternatives that might have been the cause of the collapse of the World Trade Center Twin Towers. Do we have any whistleblowers? Yes. Kevin Ryan, fired from his job for making public the fact that NIST hired Underwriter Laboratory to perform tests. And these tests showed that the building should have remained standing. In fact, there were four mock samples of 35-foot spans, two 17-foot spans and two 35-foot spans with fireproofing, just like in the Twin Towers with the floor decking. Now, there's 2,000 degrees of fire put underneath this assembly per ASTM E119, and twice the known amount of load that was known to have been in the Twin Towers. What happens? None of them fail. These are the four tests. The steel temperatures uh, were over 1,100 degrees average. Footnote number three documents that no failure occurred. In fact, there was only three inches of deformation. What does NIST do with this experimental data? They throw it out and they claim that there's a 42-inch sag, ten times the value that resulted from the experiments. Do we have expert corroboration? Well, Here's Van Romero. It's too methodical to be a chance result of airplanes colliding with the structure, this explosive expert says. After the airplanes hit the World Trade Center tower, there were some explosives, in my opinion, inside the buildings that caused the towers to collapse. Mike Taylor, a demolition expert, looked like classic controlled demolition. Collapse of the Twin Towers mirrored the strategy used by demolition experts. How about this structural engineer, Ron Brookman? Explosive clouds of dust and debris moving horizontally and vertically upward as the collapse of World Trade Center 1 and 2 are just beginning does not look anything like a heat-induced gravitational collapse mechanism. Why a complete collapse of the Twin Towers became inevitable? Why would all 110 stories drop straight down to the ground in 10 seconds, pulverizing the contents? None of the official reports address the issue of total collapse. William Rice, structural engineer, also with Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. The prevailing theory would have us believe that each of the Twin Towers inexplicably collapsed upon itself, crushing all 287 massive columns on each floor while maintaining a free fall speed as if the 100,000 or more tons of supporting structural steel framework underneath didn't even exist. How about David Scott, structural engineer with AE 9-11 Truth? Near free fall collapse violates laws of physics. You can memorize that one. How about Scott Granger, fire protection engineer with AE 911 Truth? All three collapses were very uniform in nature. Natural collapses due to unplanned events are not uniform. How about Ed Muniak with us today, fire protection engineer? The fires were very weak, oxygen starved as evidenced by the black smoke, steel temperatures were low. All three World Trade Center collapses have no resemblance to any previous high-rise fire. How about Mathis Levy, who later joined the FEMA team? If you've seen many of the, of the managed demolitions where they implode a building and they cause it essentially to fall vertically because they, they cause the, all of the vertical columns to fail simultaneously, that's exactly what it looked like and that's what happened. That's what happened? 
What happened, Mathis, after you joined the FEMA team? Did you look for controlled demolition with your initial hunch? No. Neither did this gentleman, Ronald Hamburger, who also joined FEMA after saying, it appeared to me that charges had been placed in the building. Never looked for controlled demolition. How about foreknowledge of these two buildings? FEMA was on site with their exercise tripod too. They had hundreds of people from FEMA, federal government, and the state office of emergency management. They were getting ready for a drill in downtown Manhattan for a biochemical attack. This is per New York Mayor Giuliani. Tom Kenny from FEMA says, we arrived late on Monday night, went right into action on Tuesday. Coincidence? Maybe. Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. I went down to the scene and we set up uh, headquarters at 75 Barclay Street, which was right there with the police commissioner, the fire commissioner, mm -hmm. the head of emergency management. And we were operating out of there when we were told that the World Trade Center was going to collapse. Who gave you that warning? We have plenty of video evidence you've seen and this suggests all the features of a classic controlled demolition with those exceptions which are atypical of classic controlled demolition. None of these features can be accounted for by fire, let alone all 10 of them. We have supporting evidence. This all goes to support the hypothesis of controlled demolition. It's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. If you're with me so far, you have big problems. It's much easier, given our human nature, to go right into paralysis and take no action because the implications of this are absolutely staggering. We come up with these kinds of questions, which are valid. Uh, our government wouldn't do this to us. Well, we're not saying your government did this to you. Somebody was responsible for this. Somebody, somewhere on the inside. We don't know how high up it goes. We don't know how wide it is. I would have heard about it by now. You are hearing about it now. I didn't hear about it until two years ago. It couldn't have been kept a secret that long. Well, the Manhattan Project had thousands of people. It was kept quite a secret for a very long time. I'm not an expert in controlled demolition. Well, wait a minute. Neither am I. But you are the jury, and you have an obligation to make a decision. Guilty or not guilty is typically the decision. In this case, explosive controlled demolition or fire. You have to take this information, process it through your brain, and come up with a decision and then a course of action. I'm going to help you with the course of action. The decision's a little more difficult. And don't do this. It's too horrible. I don't even want to think about it. I did not even see this stuff tonight, the worst form of denial. You avoid the debate, go back to sleep, and become a part of the problem. And it is a huge problem in America. America is asleep at the wheel. Very few of us know about this. You have got to get motivated with this information and take action based on your response to this rational, scientific, forensic-based information. Work through your fears. Yes, there's fears. If this happened to us, then it could happen again. Then who's in control? There are a heck of a lot of questions. We have disbeliefs and mindsets that are contrary to our acceptance of this information. There's no way to get a handle on it for a lot of us. I'm a Reagan Republican. Consider what I had to go through. We got to get informed and inform every other architect and engineer that you can find and everybody else that you know. Support a new investigation. Support these people who demand a new investigation. How about 200 9-11 survivors and family members, 110 military intelligence, law enforcement, and government officials, 170 distinguished professors, 110 entertainment and media professionals, all endorsing a call uh, for a new probe into 9-11. Visit patriotsquestion911.com and look for Andres von Bülow, the former defense minister of Germany, who says this is unthinkable without year-long support from secret apparatuses of the state and industry. How about Francesco Cosiga, who says the disastrous attack was planned and executed by the American CIA? How about Yukisha Fujita, traveling around the world today, prominent senator from Japan, demanding a new investigation? 
and Paul Hellyer, former Minister of National Defense of Canada. I'd like to see a much tougher, more in-depth inquiry. We have to try to get at the truth. Well, what happened to the truth? Let's take a look at this quote from William Colby. Maybe it can shed some light. The CIA owns everyone of any significance in the major media. That's a heck of a statement from the former director of the CIA. What does it mean? It's documented in many places, including Project Censor, dedicated to bringing all of us the 25 most censored stories from the mainstream media. Why did we not see the truth about 9-11? Well, it appears as if our government lied to us about the building collapses. The 9-11 Commission report reinforced that lie. FEMA and NIST justified it. And the corporate media repeated it, and they hammered it in. We really didn't have much of a chance. Now, we've shown here today that explosives were used to destroy each of the three World Trade Center high-rise buildings on 9-11. And it's known that it takes months of planning to set up and engineer and place these explosives. Do we think that Al-Qaeda had access to these highly secure buildings? So unfortunately, this is just the beginning of a disturbing but very essential journey for you back into the nightmare of 9-11. The evidence you've seen tonight is just a small fraction of the vast body of information that the 9-11 Truth Movement has assembled. The questions raised are numerous and ominous that must be answered in a new investigation. I encourage you to discover the evidence that I have not had time to bring to you tonight. It will take thousands, perhaps millions of us. Each one of us, therefore, in this grassroots movement has an ultimate responsibility to take the information that we provided and disseminate it. Get the DVD. Loan it to everybody you know. You must become a truth bearer. Email the ae911truth.org link along with a statement saying, check this out to every architect and engineer you can find and everybody you know we will turn heads in the halls of Congress. <laughs> Check out the other great DVDs, including 9-11 Mysteries, which you've heard several clips from tonight, and some great books by David Ray Griffin, including the New Pearl Harbor and 9-11 Contradictions. Check out Loose Change, Second edition and final cut, there's some great information available there. And go to journalof911studies.com and Stephen Jones's website, stj911.org. Demand a real investigation. <laughs> Call and write your elected representatives. Write your local television stations, radio stations, newspapers. Call in to talk show hosts. Write to national TV and radio networks. Tell everyone you know. Ask questions. Demand answers. Sign the AE911truth.org petition. Sign it demanding a new investigation. Stand up and be counted. Everyone can sign. Architects, engineers, and all else. We have several categories of people. Millions of people are studying these matters. They're called the 911 Truth Movement. For anyone that has looked into this to any degree, there is no uh, shortage of information, evidence that, of course, the buildings were blown up. Why is it that it is so difficult to get people to simply just look? There is difficulty. People aren't open to this. I, I hear that. Uh, sometimes they are, and it's refreshing. What you need to do is get one of these cards, and we provide it. We've got uh, hundreds of architects. We stick our neck out on the line for you. All you have to do is say, hey, there's architects and engineers demanding a new investigation. What do you think? And ask them, what does this picture look like to you? I'm just curious. Nine times out of ten, they'll say, it's an explosion. It's a mushroom. It's a volcano. Support us by becoming a sustaining member. You can make a difference. We are a nonprofit organization that has our hands tied for lack of funds. We need to get the word out to the building professionals. For $10 a month, as little as that, you can become a sustaining member. Architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth 
are at the apex of the 9-11 truth movement. Why? Because we have those who have the necessary credibility to raise eyebrows and gain attention. We need to get the vinyl banners, the DVDs, and the brochures into the hands of the real heroes of the 9-11 truth movement, the people willing to get the message out on the street. We are change, truth action, project for a new American citizen. These folks need your support. We need to act. The power of truth is greater than the power of the lie. So get informed and begin to let the truth speak through you. And get informed with, through our website. You have all the information you need. Sign the petition here. Follow the red arrows. Become a sustaining member here. It's real easy. Given the numerous warnings of far worse terrorist attacks and war plans that are in place, we need to do something. Speak out, because a time comes when your silence is betrayal. Thank you so very much for your attention today. Thank you so very much.